Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I think most of you know me, and I know most of you. I'm David Morrison, Director of Historic Harrisburg. Uh, this is the second in our annual series of how-to programs, uh, very generously sponsored by the Auchincloss Family Fund, and we thank Sloan and Susan Auchincloss not only for their support, but for encouraging us to do this, and this really was an idea that began with a meeting that we had with them a couple of years ago, and the fact that there is need for more uh, hands-on knowledge and understanding of all the different uh, trades and specialties and techniques of, of historic preservation. We had a very interesting and, and informative program a year ago on restoring old wood windows, and our speaker, John Littner, hi, come on in, grab some refreshments and a seat anywhere you like. Uh, John Lintner talked about how no wood window is beyond repair and he showed us really some very interesting examples of that and we've been advocating that ever since when people call us up and ask for a good window replacement company. We don't give them that, we give them John Lintner's phone number. Uh, so hopefully that's helping. So with John's suggestion, we have a program this year on uh, uh, restoring and preserving uh, historic masonry. And uh, one of the country's leading experts in historic masonry uh, is Andy de, de Grouche, de uh, who is from the Philadelphia area. Uh, Andy recently completed work on restoration of St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, in New York City, and he's just returned from an assignment uh, at, uh, 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 in, in Honolulu uh, at Pearl Harbor, am I correct? No, no, was, uh, I was there, but that was a vacation. Oh, that was a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> it was in Curacao. Curacao's a Dutch island. Oh, Curacao. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, we'd love to hear a little bit about some of these experiences that you've had, and, and, uh, and certainly about the the science and, and art of, of masonry uh, restoration. Folks, feel free to help yourself to more uh, refreshments as the program unfolds. I'm sure Andy will be happy to entertain uh, questions. And uh, I want to mention before we get started that uh, uh, a month from now, on uh, the fourth Monday in February, February 26, I believe it is, our program is going to also be the 45th anniversary of Historic Harrisburg Association. And hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, some of you uh, will be receiving letters in your capacity as founders and pioneers of this organization, and about half of you in this room qualify for that, <laughs> or people who have been leaders in one form or another of Historic Harrisburg Association getting special letters uh, encouraging participation in that anniversary celebration uh, on, uh, on February 26th. Everybody, of course, is invited to that event because it will also include uh, a 6 p.m. fourth Monday program, the title of which is 45 Years of Preservation and Revitalization in Harrisburg. The speaker is going to be Jeb Stewart who uh, is very knowledgeable in that subject, has been involved in Historic Harrisburg almost since the beginning in 1973. I think he got out of college in 74, came to Harrisburg, immediately got involved, uh, not only in HHA, but in, in the profession of, of historic preservation, both as a, as a city uh, executive and also as, as an investor in properties himself. So that, it's going to be a great program one month from now. Uh, coming up a little bit farther in the future, the, the March program is uh, our Women's History Month program is going to be on the uh, very unusual monument in Riverfront Park, the Sacrifices of Women Monument, and that went up right after World War I, and uh, to honor the sacrifices of women either who served during World War I in various uh, capacities as nurses and and uh, and other uh, roles, or who who served on the home front 
Uh, we think of Rosie the Riveter in World War II, but in World War I, a lot of women went into the workforce uh, for the war effort and to replace men who went into, uh, into the service. Or the other form of sacrifice was in, uh, in losing loved ones and being widowed or, or perhaps even orphaned uh, by uh, the casualties of World War I. So that monument is about that. The discussion is going to be about the broader topic of, of the sacrifices of women. Uh, and also, that's part of a broader uh, effort to showcase various different monuments in Riverfront Park. So that'll be very interesting. Our entire program uh, is in our newsletter. There are extra copies in the back. Most of you probably received the newsletter a month or so ago. Uh, or you can get an extra copy before you leave. We've, we've got great programs throughout the year. So uh, without that, without further ado, I think, uh, Andy, we welcome you. We thank you for joining us and look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Again, my name is Andy DeGrucci. Uh, I thought maybe I should start out with just a little bit of history of my own. Um, when I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to study in college, and I didn't have any money. So I thought, you know, what would I want to do if I could just wake up one day and become something? And uh, at the time, I'm dating myself, but Dan Fogelberg had a song, The Leader of the Band. His father was a cabinet maker's son. And I thought, oh, it sounds romantic. Uh, oh, maybe a trade, maybe a craft, you know? And I found Williamson Trade School. It's in Media, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. One of the oldest trade schools in the country. And uh, it was free. It was a three-year scholarship if you get accepted. They take 600 students, they, uh, uh, 600 applicants. They'll only pick 90 students. And uh, I was accepted for the Mason wow. class. So I lived at uh, the, the, the Williamson Free School of Mechanical <coughs> Trades in Media, PA, for three years. And that was 36 years ago. Okay, and then I felt, I, while I was there, I fell in love with masonry. I didn't even really know what masonry was. People think because my business has been established restoring historic brick and stone buildings for 33 years, and I have the name DeGrucci, it sounds a little like Italian, my mother's mother's from Genoa. So I think, yes, yeah, something did spark when I started touching masonry that I, th I like this, I like this, you know? But I, I, I don't have, it wasn't my father or his father that uh, was a mason. So I went to trade school for this. Uh, however, when I got out, I worked for a few contractors for a few years, and I was really naive. I didn't realize what a volatile uh, environment construction is. Uh, when I went to Williamson, my instructor was there 30 years, but had been a contractor 30 years. His instructor had been there 30 years and was a contractor as well, mason. So some of the things we learned at the school were you know, how to build elliptical arches and, you know, uh, you know, Rumford fireplace and some unusual things. Well, when I got out and I began to work for contractors and I had my handy dandy toolkit and I was going to do some, how many elliptical arches do you want? Uh, you know, shut up. We, 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 you got to lay blocks, you know, and forever. And after a while, I realized there's no benefits. There's no, uh, I could tell I was looking, looked at it as a piece of depreciable equipment. When your back goes, you're on the scrap pile like the rest of the junk, you know? And I thought, you know, I didn't go to trade school to learn this honored trade to just have it diminish. And I think that's a part of why we said, you know, we need the skills. Uh, I think you mentioned it. My ears perked up when you said um, fewer young people are going into the trades. And I think it's been sort of dumbed down to maybe be even second class citizen work, you know, if you work with your hands, you know, you know. Uh, even when I went to school, many of the family uh, and friends who were going, hey, where are you going to college? And I'd say, Williamson Trade School. And they hey, Brickland, hope that works out for you. You know, like it's like kind of a little condescending, kind of a little uh, patronizing, you know, and, and that kind of hurt. Um, but I thought, you know, this is my course I've chosen. I'm going to do it. So when I uh, graduated, I was very proud. I, 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 they gave me the key to the school. They said I, they felt I uh, fulfilled the ideals of the founder. You know, so I felt very proud. Probably the only award I ever won. But um, got out. I uh, worked for these contractors. Didn't really enjoy myself that much. I thought, you know, I'm going to start my own business. So I did. Six months into business, someone asked us to repoint an old stone farmhouse. Now, I'm in Bucks County, Quaker County, PA, where I live and have been for... 
33 years. Uh, met my wife when I was 16 years old. We dated for six years. She went to Millersville, not too far from here. Uh, matter of fact, uh, dropping names here. My son went to Messiah. That's not too far from here. <laughs> you know, that's even closer. Um, and uh, anyway, my son lives in Harrisburg area. So he's married now. But uh, anyway, I, I met my wife when I was 16. We dated all through those Williamson years, her at Millersville. Uh, pretty much lived at the same place for 33 years. And people do come by, and I'll tell you, I do have a really nice house. Uh, and, and people are amazed by it because in those years, uh, having picked up other trades uh, in the early on um, uh, construction with other contractors as well, learned carpentry and so on. So now I have a real nice timber frame all done with a joinery that is completely authentic, like perfected in the year 1500. It's a pretty, and I've, so I think it's been a little chip on my shoulder that I was like, I'm going to make a really nice house. So when all these say like, oh, I hope the trades work out for you. Yeah, well, it did. You know? <laughs> uh, so anyway, with that off my shoulder, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to serve the industry. I'm so thankful you're all here and that you're preservationists, that you're here uh, guarding what is uh, going on in Harrisburg. And um, what happened in these six months after I started a business, someone asked me at Report No Farmhouse, and I, and I did that, and I really enjoyed it. And I said, you know, maybe this should be a niche. Maybe this should be a specialty. So I um, started uh, to look into how I could learn more. And uh, the professor from Columbia University, Norman Weiss, who still is a professor of the Architecture and Conservation Department, uh, put on through a program in, in New York City called Restore, all capital letters, they had a two-year program, uh, I mean, a two-week a two intensive workshop in Williamsburg, Virginia on masonry restoration. So they well, good place to start, I'll go to that. So that was in 1986, and um, I uh, was wowed by the material sciences, the chemistry behind masonry. You know, when you go to trade school, they say, this is a brick, you know, this is a, this is a brick, kids, you know, and this is mortar, and you lay with string line, and you use a plumb bob, and all these new names, that you, new, new tools you, you learn, and, but, but you don't ask questions like, well, you know, what, what is cement, or, you know, you learn a little bit about it, but you don't really, you just you do what you're told. However, uh, when I went to um, Williamsburg, the professor from Columbia uh, began to talk about materials and talk about especially historic buildings and we'll zoom right into this lime issue which caught my attention because he said that really for 7,500 years of building history there was no modern cement, Portland cement if you've heard the term, that's used to build uh, well sidewalks, roads, bridges, uh, modern masonry, the mortar is laid with a Portland cement and lime sand mixture. Uh, there was only lime and sand. And uh, 7,500 years of building history. So, Portland cement only was invented in 1824, didn't hit our shores to 1870. Masons did not text one another, hey, quick, what you're using. <laughs> There's something new and improved. Because, do and improve for 7,500 years. That was not in our vocabulary. Masonry was the same as it ever was. You did it this way. Your father did it that way. Your grandfather. It was a time-honored thing. So here, Portland cement hit our shores here, and all your country structures, even into the 1930s, all around here, are still going to be built with lime putty that Masons got from Lime Kiln Pike, Lime Road. I didn't study the area to know, but down our way, Lime Kiln Pike and Lime everything, there's roads that tell the Masons where to go get that lime. So, uh, for 7,500 years, the cooking of a limestone, burning a limestone in a kiln, was how you produce <coughs> this, this, pu this putty that I'll explain, that you then added sand to, and you would build buildings. So, when the fella, Joseph Adspin, invented Portland cement in 1824, he came here in 1870 into Copley, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Lehigh Valley, uh, Copley cement, um, Copley, so it's called, yeah, began to produce the Portland cement. Well, early cement was produced in a vertical kiln, like they always did, in the vertical up and down kilns, in the 1910. So a lot of our materials that we substitute the old lime putties with, which I'll explain, 
uh, mirror that exactly. But uh, from 1910 till now, well, even to now, they keep changing it. They keep changing put set of port and cement, throw fly ash and other things in there. Cheapen it, same thing, you're going to get whatever you get. And I know a lot of Masons who are old time, but I'm thinking, I'm not, man, I'm getting, get my, I still got, you know, and it's not a Grecian formula, I'm telling you. <laughs> Everyone came, my, my friends, my brother's bald and gray, and, I, and he's four years younger. But, um, no, there's old timers who say, you know, the trades are just not fun anymore because the, the mortar doesn't work the same. Something's changed. And th they had added things and still called it Portland cement, but there's additives and things that are not making exactly the same. So there's, um, there's issues with that. But what I'm going back to, what I'm going to tell you about, is almost very simplistic. And I've done this lecture. Four students have been asked to come to the University of Pennsylvania uh, and, and they want the red carpet for me because what I'm going to tell you, which took, I can give you a snapshot of about 15 years of my life, that now I can bring it into you within an hour and tell you what's taking me a long journey to kind of pe put all these pieces together, which make it very believable that the line is the thing you should use for, for building repairing. When you're going to repair an old building and you want to repair it in kind, like, like to like, you're going to use the same type of materials as with which it was built with. Um, so, back to Joseph Adspin, uh, 1824, came to here in uh, 1870 in Lehigh Valley, uh, did not, um, David O. Saylor was the man who brought it here and began producing it in the couple, couple uh, He, uh, what happened was uh, Masons didn't run around telling each other, it was more like engineer buildings where architects, engineers, the word was out, and people vying for projects would say, oh, don't use the old, we are using this more a predictable, harder, uh, you know, instant rock, you know. And so what, what happened in the Industrial Revolution, you know, you think about it, uh, man wanting to chart his own destiny. We're going to build higher, stronger, better, faster, forget the old. And so this kind of concept of instant rock, just add water, back the truck up, no more big slabs of stone for sidewalks or curbing. You know, the curbs are all one big piece of sidewalk. And that's beautiful. We all love that, right? Well, so no, we don't have to back the truck up. Poor the instant rock. We love it. Instant rock. Look how fast we can go. Well, what happened with cement, by the way, this is if there's any architects in the audience, this is where their lives became very uh, complicated because once Portland cement was introduced, people ran with it, okay, but they had to uh, accommodate it. In other words, it was it, important cement makes a, a, makes hard. Sure, you get these strength psi pounds per square inch strength, but you get brittleness, and so with that brittleness, hey, the instant rock is cracking. So hey, every three feet, tell the sidewalk where to crack. Put the, put the line in it. Well, now in walls, stucco walls, which if you look at castles, the the walls are endlessly flowing. And there's no stop and go control joints. Have to be engineered by architects now and drawn into. They, they, it steals away from their uh, creative ability because they have to engineer all these control joints. So I'm already getting into showing you how ooh, cement's brittle. What, what's lime then? Well, what's very very interesting about lime, not only that it was used for 7,500 years, but you know it, it it worked. And the reason I'm saying it worked is that the quiet testimony of all the castles and buildings throughout the world that are still standing are kind of just sitting there quietly saying, you know, because we're here, it's 2,000 years later. I was in Rome recently and saw the, uh, the Pantheon Dome, 143 feet across, lime concrete. It was no cement. There's castles everywhere. So you, you have to take, a material scientist has to take a second look and say, we're not so interested in what's broken here, broken there. You know, if you see a ruins of an old barn in the woods, you know, and everything burned down, but the walls are still standing. And I was saying, that's pretty amazing. This fireplace is still there in the woods. You know, we want to study what's working about that dynamic, that this is still here with, and it's symbiotic with nature. It sort of just fits in. It actually feels natural when you see an old stone wall and its natural element. So um, some of the, the things that uh, were shared with me at the, uh, at, 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 in Williamsburg were that lime had these wonderful properties. And one is that it has these hexagonal, hexagonal plate crystal structure. Okay, So that if you imagine a bell tower in Italy, 
300 feet high, and it's 500 years old. And it's still there. And the material science person says, let's study this, because why is that still there? You think that nature would win. You know? But the plate, this crystal structure, has hexagonal plates that, while the bell tower, all buildings move, by the way. It doesn't have to be 300 feet high. Even this building, everything moves. But when it moves, the plates actually slide within one another. And so it accommodates movement. So they call it the modulus of elasticity. The line has this great ability to deflect and recover. Deflect and recover. You, you, you move things with cement in them, they will break. Okay, And then you have to put in control joints and caulk those joints and all that kind of thing. Um, the second thing is that line has, uh, is immune to sulfate attack. So what's wonderful is you see a beautiful lighthouse on the ocean. And uh, I was in Hon Honolulu, just, matter of fact, in a very historic day. I was very, for me personally loves history. I was just thrilled that not at the time when the ballistic missile attack warning, if you saw that on the news, came on my phone. That I was scared to death for 20 minutes. However, I visited Pearl Harbor the day before. The last time they said, this is not a drill, take cover immediately. That happened at Pearl Harbor. And then the next day, I'm in Honolulu, and on the phone says, emergency alert, uh, in, inbound missiles to Hawaii. Take immediate cover. This is not. This is not a drill. And that's what they said in Hawaii when we were there. I mean, we were in uh, Pearl Harbor. So uh, I was. Uh, I was in, in Hawaii. But um, the, the, it, back to, to to Rome and to uh, uh, what works worldwide. Uh, while I was in Hawaii, I also did find the old structures, the old churches, and verified the lime mortars as well. But you know, when something works uh, for thousands of years, it, it makes you set, tend to say, let's go back and think about that again. Like, let's take that a second look, because maybe that is something we should go back to. And that's where, when I started to say this is a simplistic message, and the University of Pennsylvania has had me come to speak to students, in the end, when I'm done telling the story, they're like, it's profound, it's a wonderful story. And my message, I think, the message is, why don't we use what they used to use? And they're like, that's great, you know, like, you know, you know. It, but it's so, so obvious, you know. But sometimes the, th the things that are obvious elude us because we're told, use this magic mortar for patching this and for this and that and marketing. You know, you get, you know. I remember the day when manufactured stone came out. Okay, concrete stones. They came five sheeps in a box, and I remember when. They, I saw it, it looked like you put somebody's patio on their wall, you know, and I thought, this stuff is never going to take off. And now all the best stonemasons I know are out of business because either they, we call it licking and sticking stone. You know, stick, you know, it's not stone wall, it's just stick them on. And I said, either you start licking or sticking or you're out of business. And some guys say, I'm licking and sticking. Some guys, I will not touch that stuff. And, and sure enough, with a good marketing team, doesn't matter whatever might be its, uh, you know, you know it, its uh, shortcoming, you know, it's, it's going to outperform and sell uh, the, the, the real thing, masonry. Same with slate roofs. Church, we work on a lot of churches. We tell them, get, we know what dense slate is now, and we know what nails don't rust, which is often the, the culprit for failing slate roofs. If you want 150 years of life on a roof, that's a roof right there, slate roof. People talk about the cost and so on. And that's what drives the marketing people have constantly said, hey, it's the cost. Well, now it is the cost because the quarries are shut down. So it's, it's, it's a cycle that it's really, I think, come back to bite us because now we have a shortage of tradespeople or people who know how to do this kind of stuff. It goes on and on. But anyway, going back to, you know, what works and we should mirror that because really what you want is a life cycle. No one wants to report, like, when we go to... to to uh, restore a church. Um, it's pretty much an easy sell for me because what happens is when they uh, decided in 1963 to repoint the whole church building because their centennial was coming up. It was built in 1863. It's 1963. Let's repoint cracks in the mortar. Let's repoint them. Probably didn't really even need it, but they decided to do it anyway. Well, then by the time 1978, 1980, they're like, this place has got to get re repointed. So they re repoint. Then comes 1995, or it's got to be, it comes 2018, and they're like, we don't understand why that first one lasted 100 years, and we were thinking we we're doing the right thing, 
And then we redeploy it, but now every 20 years we got to re-redeploy it. And when I then tell them, all right, if you're going to re-redeploy it now, let's go back to the materials that were used that first life cycle, the 100-year fix. And because you can't afford every 20 years to put that scaffold up and to do that job. That's why it's so important uh, that you use the right materials because otherwise you're just going to do that job again and again and again. And that's what happens with cement. So going back to the lighthouse that I saw uh, when, I, when I began to say that uh, about a lighthouse, everyone knows a lighthouse in the ocean, how beautiful it is. And in Hawaii, I, I took a nice photograph of a beautiful lighthouse on the ocean. Well, second property in Lyme that's so wonderful is that Lyme is immune to sulfate attack. So you probably know it here uh, as well as I do, but pretty much everyone in the Northeast knows that you hear, hey, watch it with the rock salt on your concrete sidewalk. It's going to eat your sidewalks. It's going to chew them up and ruin concrete. It's true. Lime is immune to sulfate attack. So you could have a lighthouse built out of lime putty or something called natural cement. It's a sister to natural hydraulic lime, but it's no cement in it. You could build a lighthouse out of that material, and you could whitewash it with lime water, and it will last hundreds of years. Just refresh the, the, the lime coat. If you build the same lighthouse out of Portland cement, the ocean's going to eat it in about 30 to 50 years. It's going to eat it. It's going to be gone. So here, cement reacts with sulfates. And you think, well, that's the ocean. We're out here in Harrisburg. Yeah. No. There's salts in all old buildings. Sulfates in all old buildings. They're in all your buildings around here. Because weak carbonic acid from rainwater causes sulfates to form. So they are in the building, and the reason people are re-repointing their buildings is because there's a reaction between the cement that's in their pointing mortar, which the lime mortar your building was built with didn't care. But now it cares, and it begins to eat at it from the inside. So that's a, a, one major reason is, first, hexagonal plate crystal structure, the, 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 the lime mortar will accommodate movement of the building. Secondly, it does not care that there's salt. So you, can put some, you can put all the salt. Matter of fact, if you're all fans of historic preservation and you found a recipe, you say, hey, I found an old whitewash recipe. It says to use table salt in there. That's right. They all did. Lime is actually uh, salt is actually beneficial to lime in some cases. And that's counterintuitive to when I went to masonry school, they're like, don't use salt. Get away from salt. Don't put winter admixtures with salt in there. You could eat the, the concrete. Yeah. That, that's not nice to your bricks, though, right? If you're whitewashing a brick wall? I'm, I'm sorry? That wouldn't be nice to your brick wall, though, if you were whitewashing it with lots of salt in it. Uh, okay. Um, or, let, let, let me try to answer that question, and then what I'll do is take the questions at the end. So just so that's it. But as far as uh, whitewashing, you know, why, why white, wa whitewashing was a protective coating, a shelter coat, we call it, a sheltering coat that would break down. So. Like, if you see these stucco over stone, I, I brought some pictures of, uh, you know, you might recognize this kind of um, exposed aggregate stucco that's on an old building. Well, that exposed aggregate that's on that old building really wasn't looking like that originally. It would have been completely whitewashed over. And that whitewash, uh, uh, with the acidity of rain, constantly washing over the alkalinity of the lime, erased it. So, but they used to put the stucco over the stone originally. So when you see people stripping stone buildings of their shelter coat of external lime plaster called render, that's wrong. It's, it's architecturally wrong. But it also was meant, originally, the Masons meant to take that old rubble, poor man's building material, collect it off the farm field to, to build the farmhouse and then shelter it and square it up and line it out with nice lines under the porch. Sometimes you see the beautiful blocks of stone under there. Whitewash it and make a, a, a silk purse out of a sow's ear, meaning take, take rubble, poor man's building material, straighten it up and formalize it to make it look, look very pretty. So lime was used as a sheltering coat. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had poor quality fired brick, because remember now we have these tunnel kilns that when you put a brick in and a week later it comes out the other end, the brick is as dense in the middle as it is on the outside. But the historic bricks have the fire skin. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll explain like, that now. Yeah. yeah, that's actually, yeah, it's part, part salmon brick, but it's part um, actually repair. But this salmon color, a lot of times you see a red brick, and it's red, 
a, like a brick red on the surface, but then if you break it, it's a salmony color on the inside. It's because it wasn't fully cooked in a very crude kiln. It was like a beehive kiln. It was like a downdraft kiln, they call it. So the way they stacked the bricks, some got so cooked by the hot fire in the middle, they would twist and turn in the kiln and become black, and they were called clinkers. Clinkers sometimes would be called, used for refractory work, or decoratively, you see this checkerboard where they put the, the, the glassy headers on the end, and they're glassy because the vitrification of where those bricks were exposed to the fire, actually, you know, you melt sand to make glass, they've actually glassified, and then they'll use them in a decorative way. But you have your, you have your, um, uh, your, your, your um, clinkers close to the fire, and then you would have your face brick further from the fire, and then your common brick further from the fire, and then your salmon brick further away. Yeah. When they built a wall, they would have three whites of brick thick, and they would use your number one face brick on the face of the house. And I, I did have uh, some photographs um, of that one with the fire, de uh, the, uh, fire department uh, model. You see how it's all very even in a butter joint, we call it very tightly laid brickwork. And it's all even in color, and they're historic brick, and they're not salmon in color because there's a fire skin that's, that forms on the surface, a fire skin from the firing. And the ones that were perfect, they'd use on the front. But if you ever look at your houses, you'll see on the sides and the back, there'd be ones that are, they're the seconds of the firsts. In other words, they're still face brick, but they are seconds of face brick. Then in your three thick, three brick whites of brick thick, they would put the face brick on the outside, they put the common brick to receive the plaster on the inside, and they put the salmons in the middle. Okay, so if ever someone said, bought a, you know, brick were expensive to produce, because you know, you clear a farm field, poor man's building material, you had the material running for. You had bricks made somewhere and brought in by ox cart in the 1800s, you were in the chips. So, people would, so if I ever see, ever see a brick farmhouse, as opposed to a stone farmhouse. That was a more prestigious house to have in the day. Now, so much so, that see this, it's not even bricks on here. In order to keep up with the Joneses, people, you'll see stone farmhouses, they're stone, rubble stone, rendered as lime plaster, and then lined out and to look like bricks. This is actually faux bricks and faux joints. And why they would do it is to say, we're in the chips, and they were. It was a Trump ploy. Fool the eye to make it look like. And so it was a big thing. So anyway, whitewash would be used as a waterproofer in the day uh, and a sheltering coat if you had poor quality fire bricks. So sometimes people would build a brick, but they'd buy the cheaper brick. And then... The I've heard that, you know, the salt will... Those same bricks will many times the salt will work its way into the bricks and start it, breaking and falling. And what yeah. Else I've heard. What it is is... is Salt, um, crystal, they, they build upon themselves. So you'll see a crystalline bridging and, and, and they would actually start to grow uh, larger. So sulfate, sulfates can get into a brick and begin to expand and break the brick apart. Mm -hmm. But um, the, 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 uh, the, the topical uh, of uh, salt on the surface mm -hmm. in the whitewashes is okay. The other is, is that, you know, Believe it or not, marine work, um, there's a, uh, uh, the, I, I import a line from France that's a naturally occurring hydraulic line, it's called. And there's a, a long reason why I do that, and I'll explain that reason. But uh, that company is 175 years old, and there's, there's marine installations in the north of Scotland, the worst environment ever. And it's in the water, and they don't even use, in the mixes, fresh water. They'll use salt water because the salt makes it, the, the lime harder. Mm -hmm. and that, and that's it. So salt, you know, can, it, it's like a lot of things. You could say that, is water our enemy? Because water is often the culprit for the demise of historic structures. Well, you know, we gotta, we're 80% water, you know? So it's not, you know, you can get along with water. You gotta figure out how to get along with water. Mm -hmm. And the majority of what Gilded masons from old time. You know, when you had a masonry guild that, that was from many, let's say a snapshot of three, four hundred years where it was father to son to father to son and going on, they knew how to build to process water. Everything was about processing water. 
Even um, the gargoyles come from gargoyle. You know, they would sit out proud from the rooftop to cast the water away from the building. Underneath the window, you'd feel a little a kerf under the window to help it to drip off. Everything was shedding, shedding, shedding water away. Well, here's leads me right into the another incredible property about lime. Hexagonal plates, doesn't care about salt. Next thing is that um, it's breathable, okay? And it gets along with water because it's breathable. Okay. If you see modern uh, masonry pointing, uh, and matter of fact, on that table after we're done, there's lots of examples of different styles of historic pointing. Sto they call them joint profiles. If you see modern brickwork, you see that kind of concave joint that's done with a convex jointer where you strike it and it's a half around. If you talk to masons and they'll say, because this is how we talked when we first got out of school, we'll make it nice and tight, keep the water out. <coughs> Historically, masons would want to, and we actually uh, do this practice and we teach it to others, to leave your joints open for water to come in. And he's like, what? You know, again, counterintuitive. You mean you're kidding me? Well, the reason is, is that, you know, when we build with cement, masons are used to putting a bag of cement, a bag of lime, and six buckets of sand into a, into a six cubic foot mixer and making a batch of mortar. And within two hours, that mortar will begin to get hard, just like concrete. Two hours, you better finish your concrete because it's going to get become a rock. Well, lime for 7,500 years of building history did not set necessarily. I mean, there's some hydraulic lime, like what I import, but lime set by exposure to air carbonation is called it. You draw in carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So when you draw in carbon dioxide, uh, you don't want to seal up the surface. You want to encourage uh, the air to get into the line to help it to fully cure. So when you see um, certain style pro joint profiles where you have a cutoff joint, the cutoff joints where you lay bricks and you just take a trout and cut it off. You don't tool it at all. It's just cut off. And it's, it's decorative that way. But when you talk to an Asian today and say, hey, look at that beautiful uh, decorative point, you say, it has to be repointed. Look, it's all open, open port. No wonder you're, you're, you're having a leak. Could be the flashing or something, but it might focus on the wrong thing and say it's, it's, that, it's that joint profile. Well, uh, lime mortar has this ability to breathe in the sense that when you first uh, cook a limestone and you hit uh, a magic rate number between 1,600 and 50 degrees in 2000, you will push off all the bound carbon dioxide in the stone. And the stone, when it's done and out of the kiln, after it's cold, it could be a week later, the stone will look like a stone. And it will be 44% lighter than when it went into the kiln. But what that is lighter because the carbon dioxide got pushed out. Well, for thousands of years of building history, when you would order quicklime, you would order this material from the kiln, from the, from the lime kiln pike, that was cooked like that, and they'd bring it by ox cart to the job site, and on the job site they would slake it. And what slaking is, like slake your thirst, you're thirsty, and it seemed to them that the stones are thirsty, because look, you give it the water, and it just bubbles and boils, and will boil, it'll turn into boiling water within five minutes of the, react, the exo, violent exothermic reaction that occurs between the, the uh, cooked limestone, calcium oxide, and the water you have. So for thousands of years, it's an ocean nightmare that you would bring this stuff that would be so dangerous that when you add water in five minutes, it was boiling, and you'd add sand to it, and then you'd lay bricks and blocks and stones. No, blocks, stones, okay? Now, how you can recognize if you have this on your building, it's called a hot mix. When a lime mortar was uh, made by bringing the uh, quick lime to the site. Now, quick lime, I'll, I'll just s suggest something to you because, you know, even though I've been doing this 33 years, you know you learn something new every day? Sometimes out of the mouth of babes, somebody says something and you realize, I had never heard that, never thought that before. I just took it for granted. Quick lime, lump lime, and hot lime are all the same thing. They just call different names. But quick lime people know. Quick lime. Well, he said, quick, oh, quick, like alive. Because you know that now you see Creed, like God will judge the quick and the dead. Well, the dead are dead. Quick is alive. He said, like alive, alive, the old word for alive. 
I said, exactly. It is a live line. It has to be alive, reactive, chemical line. It's reactive. It's ready to do something. So when you add the water, it's called quick line because it comes to life. But even though it bubbles and boils that water within five minutes, what's interesting is if you were to interview, well, only I would I'd probably use these, these word pictures, but if you were to interview the lime mortar 50 years in the future and say, so how are you feeling now? Well, when I was a young buck, I had that water boil in five minutes. Now, with every subsequent rain that comes, I say, come, come in. I, I welcome you. I'm not fighting you. I don't want you to come out. Because it's, it's what's called in mathematics an asymptotic curve. It never quite reaches to where it's going, but it's always trying to convert back to a limestone again. So when you take a limestone and you cook it and you push off all the carbon dioxide, that limestone if anybody doesn't know, limestone, lime, is the bones and shells of fish for millions of years in the, in, the, in the ocean, but on top of the mountains. It's everywhere. The whole planet has lime, limestone. It's 8% of the Earth's crust. And when it's compressed under, it's a sedimentary rock, but it's a sedimentary marine rock because it's uh, the shells of fish. Not sediment like sand sediment. That's a sandstone. But when it's compressed under pressure, it becomes marble. So limestone and marble save us under pressure. Well, you take that limestone and you cook it between that, those magic temperatures of 1650 and 2000, you'll push off all the bound carbon dioxide. It's thirsty to get it back in. When it starts out, it's called chemically calcium carbonate. When you burn off the, um, the bound carbon dioxide, it becomes calcium oxide. And when you hydrate it, it's called it's called calcium hydroxide. So if you ever heard, you go to Home Depot, you can buy a bag of type S, this means special hydrate, uh, hydrated lime, type S hydrated lime. That means hydrate. He said, because you know that ocean nightmare that everybody would be scared to death of, of boiling and burning and lying, oh my gosh, you know, can't do that on a job site. We've done it for you. And they blow steam through it so you have a powder that's already been slaked. But there is a profound difference between using that and no cement in it and using other lines. And that's the key thing that you, sh that you would need to know. So here, lime has this ability to, to, to breathe, and when water comes in, it says, no, I don't fight you. I'm actually trying in a lime cycle to slowly convert asymptotically. I'll never get there. He doesn't know, but he, he's trying to become a, cal a stone again. And what it does is it takes carbon dioxide out of the air. So here, when a, 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 a bell tower is moving and the plates are flexing, if a fissure were to open up, the line actually has ability to self-heal. To, to heal. It's, it's autogenous heal. Matter of fact, this is where I started my story by telling you I spent two weeks with Norman Weiss at the, at, from Columbia at uh, Williamsburg. But it was the sentence that he said. He said that, see, the reason no one's repointing old uh, castles and buildings that are three and 500 years old, because they're fixing themselves. And I, and I was in the front row like, well, come, come again, come again. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and same as I said to this gentleman, he'd say, questions answered. Right? So uh, afterwards, I'm like, you, <laughs> you said it had autogenous healing. And you said just like a starfish breaks its leg off. It grows another one back. You're saying these buildings grow another leg. They fix themselves. Yeah, that's right. Well, can, can, please, how, how's this going on? All right, so I found that even though he had the tip of the iceberg of information, he didn't quite understand it. I mean, don't ever tell Norman that. I mean, I really idolize the guy. I think he's a wonderful guy. But I don't think he understood it, and many people didn't. And I was started to go on this quest to say, I'm going to find out how, because every book you read says lime has the ability to self-heal. And I could not find this out until I got to the Scottish Lime Center, Scotland, in Fife, Scotland. Mm -hmm. It's a whole center dedicated to lime. It's like Nirvana. Like, oh, you know, because I, I, I'm very much into lime mortar in my trade, and this is an ancient material that's going on forever. So I'm at the Scottish Lime Center, and I'm like, can anybody tell me? And they go, that's easy. And I'll tell you, once I tell you, it's funny how, you know, you see a magician, 
And he does this trick, you know, David Blaine, Street Magic, and you watch him, the guy who's possessed by Satan, you know. But then if he shows you his trick on the side, eh, it's so easy, I, I can't believe I missed that, you know. It's the same way. So what it is, is that when you crudely burn the limestone, cook the limestone in the kiln, between 1650 and 2000, um, remember, you're using wood for fuel, you're using what's local, stone kiln, very crude, it's not always fully cooking through to the center of the stone. And by doing that, there's some amount of the stone that's not fully burned. And that part is called free line, or available line. So when a bell tower moves and a hole of fissure opens up, when subsequent rains can rain in there and soaks in and say, hey, we like you, come on in here. You know, we're still trying to convert to limestone and thank you for that little bit of carbon dioxide you're giving me. And goodbye, rain, you know, and it goes out, it evaporates out. As it does that, if it brings into solution, see this variable line or free line will go into solution and come out to the surface and crystalline bridge, just like salt does. Look, so if you ever have a water softener, anybody, who have those big plastic tubs, you fill it with salt. Well, you might come back a month later and say, I'm going to check to see if I need to fill it with salt. And you lift it up, and, and you go, hey, it's still full. And then you wait, 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 wait. And you hit the side, and the salt drops down into the water below. You realize it's not full. It's just crystalline bridge. Salt has the same property of crystalline bridging across itself. So lime will seal its own fissures by the available lime that comes out from the sink. So here, another, another profound reason for lime. It likes water. So, it's a, so instead of fighting water, because in the end, you can't fight water and win. Water, in the big picture, will always win. So if you can get a symbiotic relationship with water, okay, water, we're going to work together, then you're going to last for millennia. So here, this is the way to do it, is by using material that likes water. Now, how does this, you know, we, we, a lot, oftentimes you'll talk to masons, they'll say, hey, I've been doing this 30, 30, like I've been doing 33 years, I have a masonry restoration business. But that is a baby. I'm tired, too. You know, I'm telling you. I'm, I'm, my guys, we're all in our mid-50s. You know, I employ 22 people. We're, 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 it's, the stones are kind of winning sometimes, you know what I mean? But anyway, you know, we're, we're tired, but uh, it, it's 33 years. It's still a baby compared to what happens in 500 years, 1,000. Now, you might think, yeah, but my customers are not, hey, we're going to flip this house. We don't care. My customers are churches who say, we've been in the community 150 years, 200 years. We want the 100 year, we want to pass the baton to the next generation of stewards of this building to say, bless you, let's put flowers on their grave, we love those people. Not curse you, why did you do this to me, to the building committee, we can't stand this. Okay, so there are my customers, people who have um, estates that have been in the family for hundreds of years, they also have that feeling of stewardship, and people that just have a Historic structure, it could be a row home, but they think, but not under my watch. Under my watch, I'm doing the in-kind, like-to-like replacement to make sure I've, I've been a good steward of it. And so they're always our customer. One of those three are usually our customer. And so, and then we get along great, because we all we want as craftsmen is to get an opportunity to do the right thing by the building and to be paid for it to do it, but to, you know, do, do a proud job. So... In knowing, and, and why it's important too, when I do these talks for Masons, they often, if you ever interview a Mason who's been doing something for 30 years, you think, what is wrong with you? you know, that's the first question. <laughs> Second, you realize, like me, we're just too dumb to quit. We just, this is what we do, okay? We've been doing it forever, we don't know anything else, that's what we do, and we like it. <clears throat> and and uh, so we, we do that, and the truth is, is that if you say, you must be in it because of the big bucks, is that why you're mistrained? Yes, we want to make money, no doubt. But most every craftsman, Mason's also pick on especially because I know them. You're driving down a the road, they love to say, I did that, Jeff. I fixed that house. I built that one. I did that. They love that. And so when I went to Scotland, to Scottish Farm Center, and they said to me, there's dynamics about mortar that can give you the long-term service life. You know. And... I said, you know what, I want my work to be like that. So where do I get that? That's what motivated me. So to, um, I ended up saying to them, um, and, and, and this is probably more than you want to know, but I think that part of what you would need to know on every day, day-to-day -day basis is if you look at your mortar 
on a building. You see these little lime blends, we call them, lime inclusion. Uh, they're little chunks of lime. Matter of fact, they're all the white specks. I can pass this around. They're all the white specks that are in this uh, plaster that's exposed. That means it's a hot mix. That means they cooked the lime, they brought it to the job site, dumped sand on it, because they dump sand right away on top. Because if you don't, you put water right on that lime, it'll start pop, 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 shooting lime everywhere. So they would dump sand, then add the water, then they'd mix it all up, and while it's hot, boiling, remember I said boils? They would lay bricks in, in the wintertime, too. They, it, it would be a hot mix. So every time you see lime chunks, that's a hot mix. Now, if anybody ever heard, well, I thought that they aged lime in a pit for like, for like who knows, 10 years or whatever. It's true. Louis XIV, worshipful plaster, you, it was illegal at the one time. Matter of fact, some, some historic uh, uh, towns in Europe still have it illegal. Now, again, if your lime wasn't been aged 30 years in the pit, because every day that's under the water in a pit, it, particle size will split, and it'll become finer and finer and finer, so you could do this incredible Louis XIV worship of plaster. But that doesn't have those big chunks. The stuff has big chunks in your bricks, and you see it in your mortar around here. Um, let me see if I have another picture of mortar to pass around with the slime inclusion in it. Um, let's see if I have one picture that good now. Well, you, you get the idea because you'll, well, I can pass this around. That's, if you see that in your mortar, then you know you have the old lime mortar. Um, another way to tell, and on our, on our website, LimeWorks US, you can actually see a video that shows you three different things. If you take a little white vinegar and spray it on those little lime inclusions, it'll start to bubble. Just like soda and vinegar, you know, if you start to spray the lime with vinegar, it'll bubble. So you'll know it's lime. So, okay. So you want to do it right by your building. You say, I want the stuff that flexes. Great modulus elasticity, right? I don't want the hexagonal. If you start to use cement, the, the, the problem is when you encapsulate over the surface of all the historic joints, on a three brick thick wall, or most of your farmhouses and barns that are stone are two foot thick walls, all built with a crumbly sand and clay bedding mortar, we call it. The final pointing, if you were to say, I'm going to fight water and win, you're going to seal up all those joints, and then what's going to happen is the building will move and fissures will open up. Nor'easters will blow water against it, and that will wick into that bedding mortar that's like a bounty paper towel. It's very punky. It's sand and clay, the bedding mortar of a stone building. And once it gets in there, and then the old buildings just say, hey, breathe, lime mortar joints. Let the moisture back out. It'll come up to the cement and like, I can't get out. It's too dense. So what will happen is the moisture will start to go out around the sides of the bricks, and, and take the faces of the bricks off, exfoliating the face of the brick or, or just or degradating the stone. So that's why you want your mortar joint to be breathable in that it's a breathable. Bring it in, take a breath in, take that carbon dioxide, you're trying to turn to a limestone anyway, okay, fine. And they, then let out your moisture and let that wetting and drying, 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 wetting and drying cycle. And I say it so many times because we're having one little conversation, but five and ten and twenty years can go by, you know, in terms of wet and drying rains, if those cycles continue to go through the joint and not the face of the brick or the stone, then it would be the joint that would degradate over time. What's beautiful about historic structures, though, you go look at those joints and you see, my gosh, even though torn and tattered and little fissures and cracks in the joints, maybe from original shrinkage, for the most part, the amount of mortar loss from the face of where it was to going back, especially with a two foot thick wall or even a three one, it's not much. And so really the lime does quite a good job of processing uh, processing water through the joint. And and if and if anything were to be sacrificial, because when you have beautiful carved stone, brown stone like this, and you were to seal this up with some nice rock hard cement, and then all of a sudden these are more absorptive than is the and the wetting and drying goes through here, this begins to fall apart, and these are irreplaceable, where the joints can be a sacrificial replacement item. Oh. So, so with your strengths of mortar, you have, and many masons think, you know, when I say, use lime mortar, they say, no, you, uh, I don't even use lime, I use cement, straight cement. I, I have guys in New York who say, I used to only use lime. 
Okay, well, that's one solid impervious rock. Okay? Now, in preservation, you'll hear, in the preservation breeze number two, add two lines and add one cement. Make it weaker. And that was a theory that I call up just like the theory of blood level. You know, <laughs> when you see the barber sign spinning, red, white, and blue, the red stripe, if you know historically, does anybody know? Blood level. It used to be to have a dashery. Yeah, give me a little trim here and let a cord out, you know? Somebody along the way said, you know, I don't know if the barber should be doing that. It's not really good medicine, right? Let's, let's, let's stop that. So there was a window of time when it was acceptable to let your barber do that, so much so that everybody's thing still demonstrates that red line. And somebody said, stop, hold the phone, stop that, right? Well, right now, the preservation brief from the National Park Service says, Put some in there. Two, 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 two hydrated lines couldn't hurt anybody, right? Well, it doesn't hurt anybody. In the in the in the twenty and thirty year window of time that Masons would enjoy their career, they'd say, "Oh, it's looking about as perfect or as good as it as it was when I did it last." Okay, the thing is, is that there's worldwide information now with the World Wide Web, and there was a study done by English Heritage. English Heritage is the same as our Park Service here. It's the Park Service of England. And they did a 10-year study on Hadrian's Wall called the Smeaton Project. And they discovered that when the constituents of the mortar mix contain 25% or less of Portland cement, the degradation, acceleration, or deterioration of mortar occurs because of that. So in theory, the thinking, the good thinking was we put a little bit of cement in there to get a little higher early strength so we feel like it's kind of durable because if you just add sand and lime, hydrogen lime from Home Depot, that falls out in a year, and it does. I'll explain why that does. It does fall out in a year. It does, doesn't, it's not hold, will not hold up to our free cell cycles. So it makes sense. Put a little bit of cement. We can trust cement. We know what cement does. But when you do and you make it weak, the salts that are formed by weak carbonic acid and rainwater that are in the walls say, thanks for making a week, I can get right in there and chew up that cement. And so with the presence of no Portland cement, could be an idea, but how do we do it? Nobody knows how to do that. But yet I said, there's castles around the world that say quietly, cement didn't exist, and we still do, and we're built with lime the same. So the Scottish Lime Center, this group in Scotland, that was charged by their government, their government said, Scottish Lime Center, we might have endless castles, endless walls in Scotland, but if inadvertently, if by our own unwitting meant to do well, we are actually putting an acceleration of a decay of our own cultural heritage. This is not what we want to fund. So um, we're going to deem you the Scottish Lime Center to understand the, the mysteries and the properties of this line, and then disseminate knowledge. Don't charge a lot of money and be a high-paid consultant. Give it away. Give it away to people. Like Andy DeGreece, you're sitting in the front row and saying, why is that healed? Why should I use this? And tell, tell people. Because when the information gets disseminated out, we will be the authors of, they want to be the authors of, the conservation of heritage worldwide even. So there is a way to do this with no cement. So I'm like, I want to tell me how to do it, because I want, I want to be the Mason says, I built that, and my, my grandkids, kids, kids, kids can say, I think my dad did that one, you know? And that was like, you know, that would be great, you know? So that is some of the motivator behind why to say, okay, if you can tell me how, and if, it's, if, it's, if it can be done. Because if somebody, if I go to a church and say, you have to use lime putty cooked with wood, and it's going to be alive and reactive and convert to a limestone, and it'll be $1.3 million to point your bell tower. They'll be like, well, you know, we were with you until the one point anything, you know? Well, same goes for not just the church. I was, I'm in a hard position because as a contractor, I have to appeal to my customer who wants to hear palatable price. But then secondly... I have guys that work for me. They're like, Andy, we don't know what you're delivering. You've got a lot to say. We want to check in at 7, and we're out at 3.30. Whatever you want us to do, you tell us use peanut butter, chunky with peanuts, and whatever, <laughs> whatever you tell us, we're pointing with it, okay? But in by 7, out by 3.30, because lime putty, in the world, there's only two kinds of lime. Clean and dirty. Clean and dirty. 
Now, the, the ASTM, of which I'm on the, line, the structural committee for ASTM for structural lime, we designated high calcium pure lime, we designated dolomitic lime, and magnesium lime. But the truth is, worldwide, it's always been clean or dirty. It means clean, high calcium. 98% pure, it's white. You can brush your teeth with it. Matter of fact, drink orange juice fortified with calcium, that's food grade lime. Tums, <clears throat> food grade lime. When you have impurities of magnesium, it becomes magnesium dolomitic lime. You can, maybe you've heard those terms. But really, truth is, it's, it's either clean or it's dirty. The clean stuff that sets with air, air setting lime. See, then it falls into two other categories. There's air setting lines and there's water setting lines. Air lines and water lines. Uh, if you use the air lines, it takes six weeks to fully reach carbonation. So back 25 years ago, uh, we'd get bid requests from the government to say, repoint this, whatever, and use this lime putty that's been aged and it's all burned with wood and it's going to convert to lime. First of all, they want $125 for a pail of it, so the job cost would be out of control. Then we'd say to the guys, plus, guys, it doesn't set with water. Like, you know, you add cement and everything sets with water in two hours or so. This stuff sets in six weeks. So we got to cover our work with burlap and nurse it along. And let the Scottish have a term for it. We have to cherish our work. And, you know, you got tough construction. You're like, yeah, check in. Yeah, I'm cherish my work. You know? <laughs> Some are like, yeah, you got to cherish your work. Come on. Like, your, your dad will beat you up. You know, see, there's no dad and grandfather to appeal to anymore, you know? So... Yeah, you got to cherish your work. We got to keep this under wraps and mist it, and keep it curing slowly. You know, wasn't going to go over well with my guys, but I found naturally occurring hydraulic lime. That's hydraulic sets with water, not with. So that's more the kind of what they're used to, because it sets with water. Instead of two hours, it's more like six hours. Instead of 28 day strength to test how well it worked, it turns into. Three times, 91 days, as you test it for that curve, this 95% strength in 91 days. So all this stuff I'm telling you is the things that, you know, Scottish Lime Center conveyed to me, Andy, you want to get the good stuff? Go to this company in, in France, St. Astier, and they've been around for 175 years. They know lime, and they won't steer you wrong. And it's true, I'm very, very impressed with uh, Europeans and their cultural heritage. They really are serious about the lime, must be served and cooking. It's a mission. Cook the stone. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, and, 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 and to find them, you had to go to a sleepy little village of winding streets with stone sidewalks, stone, everything. And they're like, why did we invent some, we still be living like that, you know? Everyone has to be a billionaire now to live like that. But anyway, that's another point. But the point is there that, that it was a sleepy village that said, we've always done it this time honored way. We cook the stone this way, you know? So I got this, so it took me some nerve to go buy a can't buy a ship container of it. So this is 20 years ago, and I buy a ship container of it. Took me two years to use that ship container up, pointing buildings, whatever. But I'm feeling like I'm doing the right thing. So here, meanwhile, University of Pennsylvania, Columbia said, hey, yeah, Mr. Lime Guy, you know, a little bit too excited about Lime, give us some of that. We want to do our independent testing. They did their own testing. They said, you know what? You are really onto it. This stuff mirrors everything built for 1900 in our country. Next thing you know, the conservators are telling the conservators, and yes, feather my cap, thank you, friends that said, I hope masonry works out for you. <laughs> I supplied all the mortar to sort of point St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan. And, I'll, and, and the prize, University of, uh, uh, of Virginia's Rotunda Dome, that's uh, a World Heritage Site in architecture. They won't let anybody touch it, but all the plaster and all the mortar restored, I supplied it. Lime wow. works. See, I got, I, got, I got dual personality. That's my nature in company. What do I, okay, I'm Lime Works too. I started a company because it took me two years to use that first ship container. Now I bring in three ship containers a month. And I make lime mortars, plasters, paints. You know, and, 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 I, and I mentioned my son went to Messiah, okay, computers. My other son's at Drexel Computers. I've had them, when I had to go do date work at Daniel Bloom's Homestead, I said, you're laboring for me. I, I, every time I had a historic structure, got called from uh, Mount Vernon. Come down here, uh, we're paying you to come to look at this, all these walls that George laid out as a surveyor by trade. He laid them out, his slaves built them. Look at the botched up mess we did with all these semantic mortars and cements. 
we got to redo this the right way. So they encourage you to come and get the core of the wall, pull out the original. I end up making two tractor trailer loads of it, ship it down there. But I brought my, um, let's see, he was the uh, seven, uh, at the time he was 17 year old son. He went to, he's a director. I'm very proud of him. He's, but I couldn't get, I can't get anyone to go on the trades. But I don't know, I don't, it's not that convincing. But, but I said, you're going on this sales call with me to, to Mount Vernon, trying to get him to say that this could, this could be very interesting. And who knows, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they'll come back to it. You know, one day they'll, they'll say, I've given up whatever I'm, what I, I was going to do. But the point is, is that without me even trying to sell, matter of fact, you know, you think, you think St. Patrick's called me up and said, hey, Mr. Mason, for 30 years, whoop de doo in Quakertown, what should we repoint this $176 million job with all the conservators and architects? What, what mortar do you think we should use? They didn't ask me. They never asked me. You know why? Because they went in and took the original out. They did a scientific analysis of what it was. And what I has mirrors what they had to do. So I added the sand and everything, packaged it, wow. sold it. And that's, we have a blend, we have blending facility. We, we pack, we make. Matter of fact, my whole life is in this kit. I have 12 stock colors of lime mortars. So I make it easier for masons that can do a, go to a, like a Frank Furness, famous Philadelphia mason to all the train stations, red brick, black mortar. Just add water. Okay? It's going to set up. You're going to reach 750 PSI. That's the same as a type N mortar. That's a strong mortar. You will reach a strong mortar with no cement in there, and it will breathe, and it will have a hexagonal play as 20% free line for self-healing. And you know, we and, and it's not like I engineered that. Saint Astier helped me come up with the ratios of the perfect sand mix. I mean, but it, that's what that's the result of my whole life, of which now I try to pass it to a mason and say, here's colors of mixes that that will you can if, if you hold it up to if you keep this in your truck and you hold it up to a building and say, yeah, it looks like the mortar between the stones down the basement. That's right. It's why we came up that color. Just add water, and then you can do it. So. If, if, if in short, you say, a lot of technical stuff, he said, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta point my chin, you know? What I gotta do, go to France, you know? <laughs> I, 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 I try to bring it to simplicity, okay? So it's got the, the, the but the, uh, the, the, the validation of what I'm saying, I'm saying is that the fact that these prized buildings are being restored with the products I'm selling is kind of saying that told you I was right, you know. When I, in other words, when I when I brought my stuff, these guys studied it and say, and it's it's kind of like very, you know, gratifying, you know. So I went over. It's already seven fifteen. I know I started about five or ten after, but I and I have things that I can explain. Uh, I don't know any more than to say if I kind of ended one thing. This is a blue resin dye that was injected into historic mortar. And why? Because this will show you how old walls can breathe. The blue means it has vapor permeability. And the, mirror, the stuff I sell, see how it breathes like that? Same. Portland cement only breathes where it cracks. <laughs> you know, so if it cracks, okay, it breathes. Yeah, but it lets water in, they get stuck. And that's the problem. Even even in conservation of, of historic buildings, material scientists are very curious. So they'll say, why are those old timbers in such great shape? And they'll say, oh, it's old growth lumber. Or, you know, you, you all heard, see, when we hear things, we always repeat the same thing. But I'm the one who's saying, maybe there's another piece of that puzzle we shouldn't just keep repeating it, like the bloodletting. Let's just throw a little cement in there. That's okay. No, Smeaton Project can, was conclusive. You add 25% you add or less Portland, you're actually, even though in your window of experience, it might last the 30 or 40, but we're looking at buildings that are lasting 500 years. And we know there's buildings around here for 200 years old. Nobody touched them. They're in better shape than the ones that got repointed. They're be in better shape. So um, this shows you the crack happened, the, 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 bre the breathing comes through there while the timbers are stuck in the wall. They're saying that not only is old growth lumber, but when you encase it in a pocket that's lime mortar, lime wicks the water away from the wood, keeps it in conservation. So that's all I can say. I mean, that, that's it. That's the final thing about the lime is that it's used in the 
symbiotic relationship with nature and water movement and water processing and also not only in the mortar between the stones but even when it comes up against wood it's, uh, a pro it's something that's been used for 7,500 years and we've seen the failures with modern Portland cement and people keep trying, yeah, but I'm going to do this recipe and that recipe and this other recipe and magic mix and whatever. And in their window of time, they might say it's working, but sometimes you've got to humbly put a tail between your legs and say, all right, Mr. Scientist people, what do you have to say and how can you prove it? And when you see the old structures, it's very hard to argue with what worked. That's my thought. Very good. that some of you came with questions for Andy and uh, anybody? Justin. If you don't mind. Um, right. So uh, the new trend is uh, expose the plaster and uh, try and make the brick walls uh, glisten, make them look nice, mm. put a, a high gloss finish on them. Yeah. Um, what I've noticed in some of my apartment buildings is that the exterior walls of some of the bricks will actually just disintegrate mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. uh, when that happens, interior walls don't appear to have the same problem. Yeah. Is that due to the moisture not being able to come back out of the bricks and they're actually just falling yeah. apart? Or Well, it's true that, you know, probably a lot of things that we do in the buildings would probably make masons a little turn in their grace. You know, it's like we're taking a shelter coat, coat off of stone farmhouses or interior restaurants, it's kind of neat nouveau to knock everything off, make it look rustic or whatever, put shellac on the bricks. Right. All right, yeah. But yes, you're messing up the dynamic of breathability, you know? It's kind of like, you can put latex gloves on, wash dishes, whistle while you work, you're having a great time, honey, I'm done, give me a big kiss, right? Take your gloves off, white bubbly hands. From your body's trying to breathe, you, it's, it's imperceptible, you can feel it. It's just the same way. You look at a grassy field and you say, no one ever says, look at all that evaporation going on out there. It's imperceptible. You don't see it. We know it's how the water gets to the clouds, but you do not see it. So there's vapor transfers. When I say that there's all buildings move, it's hard. when I say a 300 foot bell tower, okay, believe it. But you know what? Even these buildings move. Small buildings move. Same way, every wall has, has vapor passing through. Now when I say some of these things, people think, well, you're from outer space. You know, they think vapors are going through you. Well, that's what they call R value, restriction to air flow. So there is air flowing through, and it's a known thing. So you're messing the dynamics up, and the plaster would be better because it controls relative humidity within the very room. So you have all the moisture from the outside, and now you have all the moisture from the inside going out and exfoliating the bricks on the faces of the outside. Yeah. So I have two things. Well, in my house, I have, and there are some interior walls that are bricks that have been exposed, and they're definitely crumbling. And should I, I mean, I've tried stuff, you know, I've asked around, and you know, don't even ask what I put on there, but mm -hmm. <laughs> should I, I mean, it's still crumbling, so what can I do about that? Well, I mean, yeah, that's we have, the first question. Yeah, it's a typical problem people have what we call dusting brick. You know, sometimes, um, you know, some some brownstones, we have material that repairs the this face. This is interior. Of the same interior, thing. yeah, same thing, brownstones, interior. We call it friable. Like, say you go up to an exterior brownstone building, I and mean, maybe, maybe many of you can picture a building like that or a brick, and you can start to dig at it and say, my gosh, I can take that stuff and just, it's like, mm -hmm. there's nothing to it left, you know? That's the sulfates, the salts, and they expand, and they just ruin the stone. Well, when we're going to fix the stone, we have material that patches. As a matter of fact, I brought well, this is from here. our building. Okay. Well, this brick, brick, that's part of what's called a lithomix patch. You can kind of see the outline of it. That's a patch. Well, when we're going to patch the brick or this brownstone, not only do we have to get the crumbly stuff out, but then you have to strengthen the base before you build on it. It's like painting. If you take fresh, nice paint, you didn't do any prep work, and you paint over the stuff that's flaking, well, the new stuff will come off with the old stuff. You've got to do prep work. So we, what we do is, and you can, but you don't have to patch the brick. What you can do, we have a product at Limeworks we import from Bavaria. Uh, although, I say Bavaria, like why all over the world? Well, one reason is all over the world is because, you know, if somebody, I often liken it to this. If you go to smash your knee, which I smashed my knee, I've got a million construction accidents, but I smashed my knee, they put some screws in there. Now, if the doctor says, hey, we're going to put your knee, you've got to have your screws put in there, it's galvanized screws, and 
for 12 cents a screw, you know. I mean, there are, there are titanium ones, but they're $12 a screw. <laughs> You'd be like, uh, yeah, you, you know, it's two $12 ones. Don't, you know, I mean, hey, what's, you know, I miss my body, you know. Same way, if you're getting serious about this work, you'd say, well, what is it from Bavaria? Why? The Germans 150 years ago isolated a product that was used by Mason for thousands of years called water glass. So if you order from us water glass, you will find it's liquid stone. And you'll find that if you take, if you dry, you don't have to pull it all out, but if you dry brush all the dust down, and then starting at the bottom and cascading over itself, give one flooded coat of water glass. And it will, a flooded coat? A flooded coat means as you spray it with a garden sprayer, you pump up and you start to spray it on there. As you move up, it'll cascade over. You know it drank it all in when it begins to push it back out and cascade over itself. You give it a so flood running, running, down. running down, yeah. Okay. So you give it a flooded coat of it, and it drinks in, and then what it does is it's called a consolidant in that the pores within the brick that have a gap that makes it fall apart, it'll go in there and fill those and make it stable. It'll stabilize it somewhat. So one flooding coat, that'll do One it. flooded coat, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and two is not better. One coat. Don't put two. Yeah. One flood of coat of water, coat of water glass helps that. So, yes, it's breathable. Yes, it is. That's, the, that's the why it's so, in preservation circles, so uh, uh, idolized that it, when, when we, we sell, when I was in Curacao, the Dutch island, we were talking about paint. See, emulsion latex and stuff that lays on the surface, remember, it's like, it's like, so you put a latex glove on, your hand doesn't like it. Imagine we're at the whole building in latex. Matter of fact, there's a billion dollar problem in Pennsylvania alone about this like elastomeric stucco that they put on buildings and, they, and the, the companies have so many good lawyers, they say, hey, it's application error, so it's dumb mason guys, right? Uh, you didn't put enough flashing in the right way, kick cats, all kind of thing. Could be true. But inherently, you just put a rubber bag over the whole building, you can't fight water and wind, water's gonna get out, get out and rot your windows. So old, if you, even if you had to use cement, you know, I'd use cement stucco before I'd use late, uh, elastomeric, except today with the colors and everything you get, and it's, and it's a good sales team behind it, it sells. But see, when you have uh, late, something emulsion based on the surface, sun dries, peels, flakes. This was the original color wash, lime wash. So when you see an old whitewash building, you might say, I don't think anybody whitewashed that for 50 or 100 years. But it's, it's, it, and it's wearing, I can see the stones through it. But it's very gracefully getting old. It's very pretty the way it looks. It's patina. How this stuff, when you see it flaking things, somebody got to repaint. So, so liquid stone, the water glass, is the thin version of the, we call it potassium silicate, stains and, stains and paints. So whenever we do want to paint masonry, we say don't use latex. Use silicate paints and stains, and they will absorb into the masonry, and because they're liquid stone, it's stone you put on there. That's a color. And then it can breathe and allows the vapor to come in and out without trapping water behind it like the paint did. And Curacao, the Dutch island, everything's beautifully colored, cut coatings, but those coatings are flaking off, and it's because the sun is just cooking them. So Another quick question. You know, there's all this thing with like cement today, countertops, floors, yeah. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What's with that? Is well, that well, any good? I mean, is that yeah. a proper use for oh. cement? Is that something people should be doing in their homes? Yeah. See, the truth is, if, if you see my truck across the street, you'll see my license plate it says Lime Guy. And the <laughs> truth is, is I own, I started this company, Lime Works, and many. I'm a proponent. Really, what I'm a proponent of is. The material that you use should be fit for the purpose. Like, right. put the titanium screw, not the galvanized in this case, okay? okay? In the, in, in, when you're going to choose the world's choice, I can choose from here, from here, here. You have to put the right application. I love concrete countertops. I love, I love that stuff, you know? Uh, there's certain applications that are great. Um, you couldn't, roads and bridges, your abutments, you can't do them out of line. You can't get 6,000 PSI out of line. Uh, but, when I said about the Pantheon Dome, 143 foot across, it's the depth, it's the coffers, it's the engineering how they made that work. Okay, there's a way. Um, no rebar. What's that? And no rebar. And no rebar, yeah. And so here, 
Uh, and that's, that's often another culprit, is dissimilar materials. You add, you know, you put in all of a sudden metal that expands and contracts at a different rate than the lime. Yeah. So you see all your aqueducts in Rome and all that, 2,000 years old, all arches, there's no steel in there. All the same thing, glass. It's, symbi it's all in kind, like to like, it's all the same. So that, that lends to a good repair. But as far as concrete countertops, I would say this, that in my own barn at the farm, where we have our lime works, I put five zones of radiant heat because I love radiant heat. And I, and I put concrete 4,500 PSI because we have to drive uh, fork trucks and pick up pallets and stuff. Uh, there's a place for concrete. And I'll tell you, though, that when you stand on a concrete factory floor, you are like, by 5 o'clock. But you put radiant heat, it gives it back to you. It's, that's a good thing. So we found that out. It gives you back, okay? But concrete has a negative in drawing life out of you. Um, the other is, is that there is something called chromium V, a five, chromium five, in Portland cement, which is a, is a carcinogen. It's a carcinogen. It's so slight, I don't want to worry you, but it's a carcinogen, you know, so it's in Portland cement. So the line that I use is naturally occurring hydraulic line. That means, to be naturally occurring means they are not allowed to by the European norms. In other words, ASTM is American side test materials. They say what goes in here in this country. But in Europe, it's the European norms. They say, if you call it natural it better not have doctored it at all. So it has to come out of, out of the ground. They cook it. They blow steam through it to make it a powder like it. And they sell it natural. It will convert back to a limestone again when you add water to it. And again, to the tune of... 750 psi for my mortars, but we can get to 2,000 psi with no cement. With other, we have three grades of this line. We call one called it's French terms, but they have feebly hydraulic, feebly. You don't use that feebly, moderate hydraulic, and eminently hydraulic. The eminent hydraulic, I at my own home have done a lime cantilevered concrete balcony. Lime concrete mm -hmm. sticks out, and I have a family crest on the underside done in this material that we, we repair the brick, but we do it in limestone as well, there. And I did a pond, little pond thing. It's all lime concrete. Um, so you can make lime concrete, but it's not going to be 6,000 PSI lime concrete. So there's a place in the world, cement will never go away, Portland cement. But where are you using it? Is it the right application or not? And for the majority of all buildings, it's just like they say, like they say, like, you know, 95% of our economy is a company with 10 and fewer employees. That's the backbone of the company. It's not IBM. It's the small guys. Same way is the majority of all mortar that's used is for veneers and all that. We could switch out and be back to breathable, more even pleasing to look at. There's, there's a certain nuance to line, which I could get into, but I don't want to go on and on. But there's certain things about it that are very pleasant to uh, view and to f the feel and the health. There's no chromium 5 in there. So it, there's, you know, good reasons again to go back to that. we got time for one more question. Was there somebody in the back that had a question? Anyone? I'll ask something that just popped in my head, but is there you're describing the, the, the process of making the lime mortars and, and, and the, the science, the chemistry involved with it. Is there any ability or is, is there anyone doing it, maybe it's you, um, to recycle any old lime mortar? Oh, yeah. Obviously it wouldn't be as pure perhaps, yeah. but is that, yeah. that something that's always happened or is that something well, that's cutting? Well, I was real proud of myself that um, I used to drive from New Hope, Pennsylvania, and I always saw this one building since 1784. It was one of the founders of New Hope, and it's actually the, the uh, like your building. It would be it's the, um, the the center for the historic society. It's their building. It's a, it's a, a museum house, and it is the um, uh, uh, the Perry Mansion. It's called by uh, the Captain Perry, who was the founder of New Hope. As I drive by, many times they say, "That's a great building." You know, it looks like. No one's really botched up that, some of that's original mortar, a good percentage, and I was always in all of that. Well, here, I'm only in Quakertown in New Hope, it's about a half hour, 40 minutes, and <coughs> here, an art dealer that we did work for in New York City ended up, uh, because New York, New Hope has uh, furniture uh, people and restoration, 
they were talking, and he gave them my name of DeGrucci. We never heard of him. He's in Quaker Town, right? So they called me, and I said, hey, thanks for calling. I've always driven by. I love this place, uh, and I'm glad you did because I want to get my paws on it because you know what? 80% of what you got is original, <coughs> and you know in the antiques, you don't want to take, if it's original and it's working, you know, don't fix it, you know? So I explained to them that even those little fissures and cracks and shrinkage, you know, it's working. You haven't had much mortar loss in 200, you know, so I mean, so let's leave that. But everywhere where they've done cement patches, let's take those out. But then anywhere where it's ready to fall out and it is lime mortar, we collected it all. And what we did was we actually crushed it all up, and then we did sift out most of the lime. But what we were after was the aggregate, which came from the creek. They used to get the sand from the creeks. They have a lot of little colorful, really nice, in, impossible to reproduce stuff. So what we did is we had more lime, the old aggregate, some more sand, and we reconstituted some and back in and put it back in the building. So that's how we view we use old mm -hmm. lime mortar for its aggregate. And, um, and, and I'm proud of it because I can drive down the road and I see... Well, that's the thing. We try to do imperceptible, uh, a, uh, in, 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 in imperceptible repair in that you, do, you can't see where the patch is exactly, you know. But I know that we did that by not throwing away the historic fabric, but reconstituting it. And if you have, you have time for one more, I think you have one yeah. more question. If, if you're bringing over three shiploads of lime, can't you make your own? Or well, yeah, well, well, okay, that's a very good point. Um, because, you know, I'm a... F <coughs> most trades people are, and I'm, I'm very frugal mason. I would not... I, I, you know what trouble it is to bring a white powder from Europe into New York City? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you. They took it and prod it and sent me a 500 dollars bill every time to say, it is just fine. And now they're, like, no, right, no. Yeah, they're waiting for the day they're going to find some other white powder, right? Well, um, anyway, uh, I would not buy this from uh, from St. Estier in France, if I can get it here. And Pennsylvania's got beautiful lime. Matter of fact, we have a, um, a line of products that we stamp platinum on it. And why platinum is because it leads, <coughs> architects are trying to get these uh, leaders in energy efficient design credits. And so when you buy local or use local things that are manufactured within 500 miles of where, that's considered uh, being a good steward of our environment. Never mind bringing shiploads to something from somewhere else. So we're proud of it because we say, no, well, we're going to put platinum on something. We're going to say it's from our country, everything ingredients are from our country, and it's made in our country by labor to our country, and that's a platinum product. So we have a few that are, that they are, though, the air setting limes. And so where air setting limes are good is if you ever see beautiful frescoes, everyone who's really a student of how to do that right knows that you don't use a hydraulic line for frescoes or lime paints, whitewashes. You use air setting lines for whitewashes and for frescoes. And so you can get uh, water lines. Geologically, hydro, I mean, air, air lines. Hydro, uh, geologically in the United States, there are natural deposits of hydraulic lime, but no one quarries them. There's not a one. And it's about supply and demand. So if you go to the lime companies and you were to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, can I tell you first, you are, the reason, I never mentioned this to anybody, but why you can't buy a bag of Type S hydrated lime from Home Depot? I mean, just add sand and water and point with it, and it falls apart in a year of free saw cycles, is that the time-honored temperature of 1650 to 2000, of which you keep the stone reactive, is kept in that window of time. It's kind of like messing uh, window of temperature. If, it's kind of like messing with grandma's recipe. Grandma says preheat the oven to 350, bake cake one hour. You don't say, well, I'm going to turn it to 750 and do it for 20 minutes. Different cake, you know, you can't eat that thing, right? So, same thing. When Portland Cement became big man on campus, and we're taking over line, bye-bye line, 7,500 years, wonderful, see ya, we're taking over. As time went on, if you go to try lay bricks with just port and cement and sand, it just could fall dead off the trail, dead. And they, hey, lime people, come back here, because we know one thing your lime does, it adds plasticity and flow, makes it flow like butter. We want you to make that lime, and we're going to add it to our, we're, we're the ones who make it strong, but we want you for plasticity, and we want you because you control the setting time of how long that mortar sets. So a lime company came in, and they said, okay, thanks for bringing us back in the game. 
And how many bags are you like? One billion bags, please. <laughs> One billion bags, we can't possibly keep up with you, right? Turn the temperature. So now the, the manufacturer of hydrate monitor country messed with grandma. Don't, not nice to mess with grandma. You, know, you mess with grandma's recipe. Now it's cooked. Um, when you hit 2200 degrees, it's the melt phase. That's where you take sand and turn to glass. And if you, but but eight, eight, uh, 1650 to 2000, the magic range for cooking lime to keep it alive to it'll convert to a lime. If you cook it at 2100 and you take a bag of that lime powder from Home Depot, I'm going to add some water to you. Make sure now. Do that magic trick. Turn yourself back to a stone again. It's going to sit there like an inert dust and say, You dead burn me. You cooked the life out of me. I cannot convert back to a stone again. And that's why I can't use lime from our country unless I buy the food grade lime. There is food grade lime that can be purchased that will convert because they cook it at a lower temperature. Can actually good. The cost becomes a little bit high. But we found a source of Pennsylvania lime that's low temperature fire cooked, and we make it for certain products, for plaster, interior plaster, for fre what we use for frescoes or paints. But they are air setting. So you're back to telling the guys, hey, you're going to cherish your work again, guys. Let's get out, you know, get out your Mr. Spray bottles and, and care for this wall part. It's air setting lime. So the hydraulic lime, exi hydraulic lime naturally occurring, exists in the United States. No one quarries it. If you told the lime companies, turn your temperatures down, you could be big man on campus again. They'd be like, go away. We don't, there's, we are selling tons of this to the port and cement industry. We have no interest in being the only one. Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, then open a quarry and sell naturally occurring hydraulic lime, how much will we sell? Three ship containers sounds like a lot a month. Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. So that's why they, you know, they haven't given me cement shoes. Got right. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Andy. Thank you.